Thank you for inviting the three of us to speak today as part of LGBT History Month. Um, as you know, the theme for this year's LGBT History Month is Body, Mind, Spirit. And as I was preparing for the session today, I thought I'd better go back and double check what my brief was. So I'm right back to the first email that you sent me and it said you were looking for someone to speak on spirituality from an LGBT perspective. Well, I think my very first response to this was, wow, there are so many different LGBTQIA plus perspectives and so many different spiritualities. How could I possibly do justice to this theme single handedly? I very swiftly concluded that I couldn't. And that's why you've got a panel of three of us today to slightly broaden the outlook. But still, I wanted to start out by acknowledging that unavoidably, each of the three of us will have our own particular angle particular life experience, particular identity in terms of gender, sexuality, relationship style, religion, and so many other factors. So in the end, none of us are speaking for anybody but ourselves. Though I hope that some of what we say will at least raise interesting questions in relation to your own life experiences, will illuminate some themes that are broadly true. And there'll be some time towards the end of the hour for your own reflections and questions on the, on the topic. As part of this preamble, I thought I ought to say a little more about the three of us on the panel, and especially to be upfront about our religious affiliation, because that's how we all know each other. Uh, my name's Jane, and I'm currently training to be a minister in the Unitarian Church. I work with a Unitarian congregation, uh, which is nominally based in Kensington in Notting Hill. Uh, but of course, like almost everybody else at the moment, we're actually based on Zoom. We decided to stop holding in-person services almost a year ago now, and we haven't yet returned to the building. I suspect it will be a while yet. So my day job in the ministry uh, means leading Sunday services, contemplative small groups, spirituality workshops, retreats, that sort of thing. And my chums alongside me on the panel this morning are also Unitarians. Uh, Shana works for the Unitarians in Hampstead and Jeff is lay pastor with the Brighton congregation. So I thought you'd, it'd be good to be upfront about that fact. But in some sense, we're, we're coming with a particular shared angle because we all belong to the same religious community. But then I thought I'd better say a bit more about that, too, because almost nobody has heard of Unitarians. Um, and that's hardly surprising. I, I've slightly lost track of the numbers, but they're estimated to be less than 5000 of us in the UK. We are absolutely tiny. So one thing which will hopefully become apparent as we speak is that the Unitarian Church is quite theologically, quite spiritually diverse. We are generally of a progressive or liberal bent. And there are some guiding principles which unite us. But there's no creed as such that we're all obliged to sign up to. You'll generally find that Unitarians will seek wisdom from wherever we can find it, and then we scrutinise it in the light of reason and experience. We don't just look to one scripture or one religious tradition, but tend to draw on the teachings of many world faiths and look to science and art and literature too. Individual Unitarians might lean towards one particular wisdom tradition, particular set of practices. So you'll find lots of us have got kind of dual affiliation, Christian Unitarians, Muslim Unitarians, Buddhist Unitarians, Humanist Unitarians. And you'll get a little snapshot into that variety from the three of us who are speaking today. But in the Unitarian gatherings that we hold, despite all these differences, what you'll actually find are groups of spiritual seekers who've been drawn together by our oh so human longings for meaning and for connection whether that's connection with the depths in ourselves, connection with something that's larger than us and perhaps unnameable, connection with a community of companions on the journey. And that variety of perspectives coming together, that's something we tend to cherish. And I suppose the other thing to mention with particular relevance to our session today is that Unitarians have historically been at least a little bit ahead of the curve in terms of LGBT equality. But as in any community, there's always more that can be done. So I said I'd kick off this panel session today with a brief introduction to the landscape of spiritual and religious exploration for LGBT people. And I guess as good a way as any to launch into that is to define our terms, though spirituality and religion are both notoriously slippery terms to define. In its broadest sense, we might think of spirituality as any pathway which leads to greater meaning and purpose in our lives, any practice of deeper reflective awareness, anything that brings about a shift of consciousness, perhaps, in that way. Spirituality tends to be about practices of self-transformation rather than rigid dogmatic beliefs, about practical wisdom and physical and mental disciplines which engage us on that deeper level, which help us get beyond our head stuff, and which actually, hopefully, change our orientation to life altogether. Authentic spirituality is something that needs to be lived out. I quite like the definition from the theologian Ursula King, 
who says that spirituality is an attempt to grow in sensitivity to the self, to others, the non-human world and God. Spirituality as an attempt to grow in sensitivity to self, others, the non-human world and God. And as an aside, there are many different ways in which we might understand that term God, but that is another talk entirely. So that's spirituality. When we talk about religion, I guess by contrast, we're generally thinking of a particular tradition, particular community, which might have its own associated practices, teachings, sacred texts or core beliefs. And those beliefs are adhered to more or less strictly. People tend to think of religion as dogmatic. It needn't be that way. We're living in a time where many people describe themselves as spiritual but not religious. Of course, it is equally possible to be religious but not spiritual, to participate in a tradition and its rituals without particularly being transformed by its practices. Or spiritual and religious, which is, I guess, how the three of us on the panel today would tend to describe ourselves. And of course, a lot of people are neither spiritual nor religious, or at least not consciously or actively. It seems that many people who might place themselves in that group do indeed tend to have some implicit spiritual or religious beliefs about life which show themselves when times are a bit tricky. For most of my life, it's been the case that in broad terms, most mainstream religion has, to put it mildly, not been welcoming of LGBT people. There are countless appalling examples of incitement to homophobic, transphobic, biophobic, queerphobic, hatred and discrimination all around the world. And sadly, a lot of that has been, to some degree, religiously motivated. And although there's been a lot of progress on LGBT equality in my lifetime, mainstream religious organisations have generally been slow and reluctant to keep up, and many really are not there yet. Although there are increasingly LGBT friendly voices in pretty much every religious tradition, this often isn't reflected in the official teachings and policies. In this country, we've seen the Anglicans wrestling with this for decades. So while LGBT people might find they're made welcome in a particular local church, there's often a sense that the institutional welcome is qualified at best. LGBT people are often seen as second class citizens. They can't fully participate, can't take roles in leadership, can't be their whole selves. Having said that, LGBT people have surely always been present across all religious traditions and they've made great contributions along the way. It's just not been publicly acknowledged or affirmed that much. But many of us in the LGBT community have understandably taken the view that if mainstream religion is going to be hostile to us, then we'll make our own way instead. We'll go freelance with our spiritual seeking. Personally, I think this is a great loss, both to the LGBT individuals who miss out on the riches of tradition and the support that comes with being part of spiritual community, and also to the religious traditions, the religious communities, which miss out on the particular gifts and insights and wisdom of LGBT people in all their diversity. So that's just a little of the context into which we're speaking today. We'll be telling our spiritual stories in the rest of this session. So on that note, I'm going to hand over to Jeff, who will share something of his story with us now. My name is Jeff. I'm the lay pastor at Brighton Unitarian Church. I have been since 2010 and I've been a committed Unitarian since 2000. I'm really pleased and grateful to have the opportunity to share my spiritual story as part of your events to mark LGBTQ plus History Month. I am a queer Unitarian Christian. I'm also fascinated by language, by the stories of words, and queer is one of my favourites. Until queer people reclaimed the word queer, it meant obviously something peculiar something uncanny, but it has layers of meaning. At one point, queer meant oblique, slanted, and before that, deep in its past, it meant twisted or turned, 
it implied a braiding of elements that don't normally belong together. And that describes my spiritual life and my spiritual story. The word has power and resonance for me. It feels to me like it honours the wounds, the scarring of growing up gay in the 60s and 70s. It honours the political struggles of the 80s, the injustice and the trauma of the AIDS crisis. But it also feels like it looks to the future too. It holds out for a defiant and dynamic inclusivity. I find in it a promise of freedom, connection and empowerment. And all of these things characterise what being a person of faith means to me. I grew up in an industrial town by the sea in the northeast. I knew I was different from most other little boys by the time I was about six or seven. And I was bullied in and out of school for being a sissy. And I fell in love with a beach. As a boy, I used to go for long walks on my own around the town, sometimes around its back streets, sometimes down to the marshes, but mostly I went to the beach. Redcar has a long sandy beach, but there are also these long stretches of rock reaching out from the sands into the sea and the most beautiful silver grey fossils can be found everywhere. I've collected them all my life. Ammonites, belemnites, bits of sea lily, occasionally even the backbone of a marine reptile. About 180 million years ago, these extraordinary creatures lived in what was then a vast subtropical delta of sandbanks and yet and shallow sunlit waters. Fossils were my first portal into a realm of otherness, into different ways of being a being. The marvel of that beach was twofold. I became fascinated by the science of evolution. I still am. And I was enchanted by the wonder of that other dimension. I still am. And the shore, that shifting line where the hard certainties of the land meet the volatile moods of the ocean, is still in many ways my spiritual home. Like lots of people, like lots of queer people, I have been drawn to the energy of edges all my life. And sometimes my encounters with the divine in prayer and in meditation have something of the same quality to them as the first time at the age of nine, I noticed the miracle of a starfish in a rock pool and announced to my mother that it was the best day of my life. In my teens and twenties, I called myself an atheist. I was hostile to Christianity. It's mistreatment of women and queer people, it's collaboration with slavery and colonization seemed just appalling to me. And yet, I'm not sure I ever really was an atheist exactly. I was interested in American writers such as Walt Whitman 
Allen Ginsberg, Jet, Jack Kerouac. And their work is informed by a kind of mystical democracy, and it is infused with Buddhist, Hindu, and Taoist ideas. <coughs> Excuse me. In my 30s, I became quite seriously ill with an obscure autoimmune disease. I had lots of support from my family and friends, lots of love, but in the years after I fell ill, there was a gap, a longing for something I couldn't begin to describe. And then I began to feel like I was being pulled by some force, pulled into places where I could sit and be still and think about my life and light a candle for the people I loved. In other words, churches. I felt reassured and restored in the very places I had so disdained. I began to learn that I could be still and quiet sometimes, and that it was okay not to be entirely in charge of my life. Those sacred spaces provided me with a context for my brokenness. I learned slowly that they provided a context for my suffering. I learned how to suffer there. I became interested in the Christian mystics, Meister Eckhart, Hildegard of Bingen, Julian of Norwich. And I also became taken by the progressive Christianity of the dissident Catholic, Matthew Fox. I was not though on a mission to become a Christian. I was exploring Buddhism too, and I was drawn to earth-centered traditions, to neo-pagan ideas. I honor those teachings, I, I gained a great deal from them, and they still live within me. Eventually, I moved to Brighton and came across the Unitarian Church. <coughs> Excuse me. I moved to Brighton and came across the Unitarian Church. I found it to be what it said it was, welcoming, respectful and open-minded. We respect the Christian tradition, but are not bound by its laws. I found the freedom there to make peace with the Christianity of my childhood. I came to the conclusion that for me there are too many riches, too much wisdom, too much poetry, too much truth in Christianity to allow myself to be repelled by the crimes of its institutions. I also began to see that the mainstream Christian churches are not monolithic. Many congregations, many ministers and faith leaders are concerned with social justice and serve their communities. Ultimately, I have come to believe that the language of the soul, the language of suffering and healing, the story of Jesus, these things are too powerful to be left to reactionary forces. The wit of Jesus, his sense of irony, his diagonal relationship with his people's scriptures, and of course his example of compassion and forgiveness. This is where I find myself today. And I am surprised to say that I believe in the resurrection, 
not just as many progressive and liberal Christians say as a metaphor, but as something fabulously impossible and uncannily real. I still struggle with some forms of atheism and some forms of Christianity. And I would accept that my struggle is based as much on grounds of taste as it is on recent argument. I don't like easy answers and I don't really care for ways of thinking that are too tidy, too hygienic, too neat. My God grows out of the soil and out of city streets, out of bass guitars and the Methodist hymn book. Our capacity to reason, to think rationally about our beliefs is important. It is precious, but that doesn't make it God's job to be consistent or reasonable or straightforward. I began by talking about queerness as the dynamic union of things, the dynamic union of things that would normally be separate. I'd like to end on that note and share with you the opening words of our services for uh, the equinox and solstice in Brighton. These are services based on, uh, on neo-pagan rituals. We meet in a circle and around the circle we light candles for the spirits of the north, south, east and west. And I begin the service by saying, we are earth, we are air, we are fire, we are water, we are spirit, we are a part of all things and all things are a part of us. I'd like to thank you again for uh, this opportunity to talk about my faith. I'd like to thank you for bearing with my dry and sore throat. Uh, and finally, I'd like now to hand over to Shana. As a child, I was committed to my faith. I don't know where it came from, but it's always been a big part of who I am. I was disappointed when my parents didn't take me to weekend school at our nearest mosque, which wasn't exactly close by, and it was worse when they didn't sign me up for the next term of studies. I enjoyed going, I did well in my assessments, and even had this idea that maybe, maybe I could be a scholar when I'm older. I didn't ever hear anyone explicitly saying that homosexuality was bad, but somehow, somewhere in my mind, I got the idea that gay and religion didn't go together. I mean, who's heard of gay and Muslim? Never, right? How could I be? But, but I'm religious. Maybe I'm just confused. Thoughts like these came to my mind when I realised I was gay, and it was incredibly hard to deal with, a real struggle. I continued to practise as I was, and it was only really when I was in my late teens and early twenties I heard similar words again, this time from other people. But you're Muslim! And mindlessly, looking on the internet at stories for retribution, that I felt like I couldn't carry on with these two parts of who I am. These two parts that ultimately make me, well, me. I had an internal fight, feeling like I couldn't be a devotee of God and be gay. Grappling with the conflict and being made to feel that I'm not good or right, I steered away from my religious observances. This made me miserable. Stopping something that I believe in because others made me feel that I should. What, what I imagined, what I was afraid of, I discovered doesn't fully come from Islamic text, with anti-gayness supposedly being part of Sharia law. 
It's the countries who follow Sharia law, merging their own rules into the legislation. Now, I'm no expert in this field, but through conversations and my own inquiry, I found that I'm not actually damned. I dislike sharing the phrase I'm about to because I cannot stand it. But one of the things that I overheard from other people's conversations is that God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. What I've come to learn is that translations are not necessarily translations. Words in one language will be translated from the understanding of the translator. And perhaps interpretation might be a more ap appropriate word, in my humble opinion. Adam and Eve, man and woman, are not words that appear in the original Arabic text. Suitable partners might be one interpretation. Sheikh Muhammad Sarwar's version of the Quran says, It is God who created you from a single soul, and out of it made it spouses to bring it comfort. Through further studies of the text, I came to understand a little more about the people of Sodom. Now, for a talk in this short space, I won't go into a lot of detail with this. But what I'd like to share is that it appears that it wasn't the sex between men that was punishable, but how and whom the homosexual acts were performed on. It is suggested that divine beings were involved, some say angels, and the sanctions were given as such. The light of knowledge around this brought a sense of liberation. One might say that I'm looking at text through a lens that suits me, and doesn't that mean the lens others see through shows their interpretation, even if it's unfavourable? The debate could go on. Before going, to pil before going on pilgrimage to Mecca, I met up with a friend who didn't respond well to me sharing with her that I'm gay a few years earlier. When we met, she asked if that means that I'm no longer gay, you know, if I'm going on this religious trip. She made me feel like I shouldn't be going, or that I should change afterwards. I really didn't know what was going to come of my experience. As I sat at the sacred mosque, the Masjid al-Haram in Mecca, surrounded by its magnificent beauty, its marble pillars and OG arches, the Kaaba, Islam's holiest shrine in sight. I closed my eyes and spoke silently inwards, praying for acceptance of who I am in this present moment. I wasn't struck down. Nothing disastrous happened to me. I actually found a bit of peace, and from that got the courage to be me. Of course, having these profound experiences doesn't mean that life is easier, or that the damaging words people have spoken of in the past simply goes away. The journey of fully embracing oneself is continuous. And I continue that journey myself, and when I found a mosque led by queer, affirming, feminist imams, I was glad to have a space to carry on my spiritual exploration. The Inclusive Mosque Initiative works to support all those who are marginalised, based on ability, race, gender, and so on. My last partner was raised in the Vaishnava tradition, or what, may, what some may call Hinduism. We were at different points in our progress of joining queerness and our spiritual lives. I can't speak to someone else's experience, but I know that she was surprised at how confidently I maintained my religious and queer identities, something she was still battling with. We wrote about our experiences, and in a poem she ended with, For now I am girl, Next time I could be boy. For now I have means. Next time I could be poor. For now I have legs. Next time it could be wings. For me, this brought up the concept of the soul coming into a different body at each time of rebirth. 
And as someone who focuses on my personal relationship with that which I see as most holy, it further supported my understanding of how the mystery of the universe works for us as souls living in this material plane. And ultimately that love is powerful. Drawn by the display of rainbow flags, my ex-partner entered Rosden Hill Unitarian Chapel in Hampstead and I followed with a visit a few weeks later. The idea of oneness spoke to me. And being in a relationship with someone from a different religious tradition who was trying to reconnect with her inner self, it was a sort of middle ground where we could both practice our faith together in a space that felt safe. Every summer, a Unitarian residential retreat takes place in the Derbyshire countryside for personal, spiritual and professional development. I attended for the first time in 2018. Every morning, over the five weekdays, there's a talk of the theme of the retreat. Although the talks were about how we should live, and in particular, how we live with the light of knowledge that we will one day cease to be, one of the things that came to my awareness was that each of the theme talk speakers had a queer identity. Now, I don't know if that was on purpose. I felt really proud and my heart warmed. There may have even been a little tear in my eye. To have a platform as a queer person, and when it's related to religion or spirituality, for me personally, fills me with awe. Maybe it's not notable for those who have been long-standing Unitarians, but for me it was a special moment. I felt a sense of affinity, like part of me was being represented, and when it comes to sacred spaces, we need that. Queer folks, we need that. To feel as though we have access to something greater, something sacred, special, divine, whatever that may be exactly for any individual. It is people society, who make things difficult, not a belief system. How do we change the notion around sexuality and religion to millions of people? It seems like an impossible task. But what I do know is that my relationship with the divine is exactly that. You may have noticed that I used the word gay initially, it was a familiar word when I was younger, but nothing quite fit me. And does a label really matter? I don't know. An activist strategy over time, regardless of the injustice, has been to reclaim words that have been used negatively. LGBT activists have reclaimed the word queer and over recent years, I adopted the word, and it has been a comforting way to affirm my identity. Having spent time reconciling both of these parts of me, I've established myself as a self-assured, queer, Muslim, Unitarian. And I'd like to close by sharing that faith does not take away sexuality. And sexuality does not take away faith. And I'm looking forward to hearing what Jane has to say. Thanks, Shana. So to tell my story, I wanted to begin with a shortish excerpt from a great little book by Mihi Kim Colt. Um, she's a, a queer Asian American Presbyterian minister. And this book's called Outside the Lines, How Embracing Queerness Will Transform Your Faith. In this book, she explores an idea that resonates with my own spiritual journey. The sense that queerness itself sets you up to engage with life in a certain way that is hugely spiritually valuable and liberating. And she's making the case that the wider church has got a lot to learn from this and indeed the wider community as a whole. Queerness should proceed. Thanks, Shana. 
So before I launch into my own story, um, I wanted to share a shortish excerpt from a great little book by Mihi Kim Colt. Um, she's a queer Asian American Presbyterian minister, and the book's called Outside the Lines, How Embracing Queerness Will Transform Your Faith. In this book, she explores an idea that resonates with my own spiritual journey, the sense that queerness itself sets you up to engage with life in a certain way that is hugely spiritually valuable and liberating. And she's making the case that the wider church has got a lot to learn from this attitude, that queerness should be seen as a gift to the whole community. Mihi Kim Colt writes this. To me, queerness is three things. Firstly, it is a posture. Queerness transgresses boundaries and allows us to simply be, without label or category, specifically around gender and sexuality. Queer is at odds with the normal, the legitimate, the dominant. It is particular and expansive. It's less definitive. It does not point to you or me and say you are queer, but instead makes a wide open space for all people to find footing in relation to one another and to their own lives. Secondly, queerness is playfulness. Queerness is experimenting. It's recognising the spirit in our wildest imagination. It makes space for dress up and acting, pulling out all the pots and pans, banging on the lids, then running around the house using them as superhero shields. It is trial and error. It is cannonballing into the waters of definitions of gender and sexuality, splashing water into the face of what is divine and human. It always tends towards a dynamic generosity, a grace that allows for mistakes and failures, because our lives are richer when we hold all of what is human. Thirdly, and most importantly, queerness is practice. Queerness is an ethic. It's a decidedly intentional personal identity, but always a social and political identity too. It addresses the real world, the everyday, and all the struggles inherent inside and outside a person. It's always an act of protest, a revolt, a demonstration, a rallying around people's humanity and dignity when larger institutions threaten it. Queerness means accompanying people in their journeys through listening, respecting, confronting, standing with, confessing and being responsible. It means showing up even if you don't get it or understand it or even necessarily agree with it. It means addressing all the bodily realities of people who are daily facing erasure and violence in all its forms, physical, structural, spiritual, and yes, religious. Some words from Mihi Kim Cole, and that is quite a dense piece. I know there's a lot to digest in it, but the essence of it, or what I take from it anyway, is that queerness is a call to liberation. It's an attitude which enables and encourages us to rip up the scripts that are given to us. The scripts that are given to us by the dominant culture that we're facing. It encourages us to play with possibilities and to look out for others who are also on the margins, just like we are. To show solidarity with those who are despised or invisible. So a little of my not especially remarkable story. I grew up in a functionally non-religious family. We were culturally Christian, I suppose, but never church going. However, I was sent to a Catholic secondary school where I held a mostly wary and sceptical attitude and I felt awkward about being obliged to join in with prayers and rituals that were entirely foreign to me. I wasn't especially hostile in my unbelief though. In my teenage years, I fell in love with a classmate, a girl, it was an all girls school. I realised now it wasn't the first time I'd fallen for a girl, but it was the first time that I'd realised that this was not normal by the standards of the day, and if I was going to act on my feelings, it might well get me into trouble. This was the late 1980s when anti-gay sentiment was running particularly high, and Section 28, which banned the promotion of homosexuality, had come into law. Everyone around me, it seemed, thought that to be anything but straight was not okay. This was the message, both implicit and explicit, from family, school, classmates, media. And this is a very typical story for anyone of my age and origins, middle-aged in the UK. That is the world we grew up in. But I particularly took the message, coming of age in that Catholic school, that embracing my non-normative sexuality would put me on the outside of religion. 
that the two were you know, incompatible. And to be honest, at that point, this wasn't something that bothered me especially much. I wasn't feeling any great religious urge. What amazes me, though, looking back, and this was surely a pivotal moment in my life, what amazes me is that as a teenager, I had seemingly the whole world lining up to tell me that my sexuality was bad and wrong. I didn't knowingly have queer friends or access to any support groups. This was all pre the internet. What amazes me now is that in the face of all this, I decided that everybody else was wrong and I was right. That my sexuality was not bad and wrong, but good and right and life-giving. And this is where my own experience really chimes with that piece I shared by Mihi Kim Cole. Realising and embracing my own queerness was the key that unlocked everything else. It shaped me spiritually, ethically, politically. From that moment in my mid-teens, when I saw that the whole world's story, the story that my family, my school, the church, the media, the government, the story they were telling me about who I was and who I should be, was fundamentally wrong. After I saw that, I questioned everything. It meant I could no longer take anything at face value. It meant I stopped caring about being normal. It liberated me from that pressure to conform and it primed me to look out for others on the margins too, to show some solidarity with fellow outcasts. At that point, I became a bit more hostile to religion as it seemed pretty clear it was hostile to me and my newly minted bisexual identity. As an aside, I should say, these days I call myself demisexual and queer as well. I switch between the labels and embrace them all. But I've always been interested anyway in life's big questions. So I spent some years after that kind of spiritually wandering, wandering in a slightly new agey world of meditation tapes and crystals and self-help books, going it alone, really. In my early 20s at college, in a physics department, I mostly mixed with atheists. But they weren't exempt from my question everything policy either. I felt that their atheistic certainty was just as poorly justified. So I quite happily settled into a kind of a weak agnosticism. I felt that these big questions could never be conclusively settled either way. But over the next few years I had a pretty rough time of it. Mental health problems, loneliness. I'd started studying for a PhD which wasn't going especially well. I didn't like the work that much and I felt pretty low. But one fellow student was very kind to me and he was a very committed churchgoer and that was really unusual amongst the people I mixed with. I remember him listening to, I remember listening to him talk about his life, his community, his commitments and I remember thinking I want some of what he's got, the community, the support for the people who are struggling, the engagement with ultimate things. But at the same time I remember thinking I don't and I can't believe what he believes. And I also thought I would never choose to belong anywhere that discriminates against LGBT people, which the mainstream church did. So all these contrary thoughts were knocking around in my head for a while. And hurrah, by this point, we did have the internet to turn to. So eventually I did a bit of research to see if there were any churches or religious communities out there that were liberal enough to be both LGBT inclusive and not to require me to believe stuff that was just intellectually impossible for me. And that's what led me to the Unitarians, though I should say I could just as easily have ended up a Quaker. But the Unitarians were one of the few religious organisations to proudly proclaim their LGBT inclusion back then. This would have been the late 90s. And I was impressed that women and out gay people had been able to serve as ministers in that church for decades. A few churches held same-sex relationship blessings long before same-sex marriage was a thing. And I tell this mainly to reflect that my sexuality had been the main thing that had led me to reject religion in the 1980s. And then a decade later, it was pivotal in my return to religion as it led me to find my particular LGBT friendly spiritual home. Now that sense of expansiveness and possibility and playfulness that I associate with queerness the way that me, he, Kim Court described it, that has been a constant feature of my religious life since then. That sense of never-ending trial and error is, in my experience, just how the spiritual search goes. I'm not expecting to achieve enlightenment or even amass all that much wisdom in this lifetime. But as I wrap up, I want to affirm that trusting the promptings of queer love and queer desire 
trusting that they were telling me something good and right and worth listening to. That's been vital in my journey. The first inkling I had that this love is good and right and life-giving, whatever the world might say, that little inkling has taken me a very long way. It set me up to keep on questioning, to keep on digging deeper, and to realise that every answer I come to, or that society comes to, is only ever provisional. Not just on questions of sexuality, gender and relationship, though I'm still doing that kind of questioning too. But that questioning attitude, that queer orientation to life, that applies to all the big questions. Each time I'm tempted in life to think this is the answer, the truth, there's another layer, another yes but refinement, another bit of complexity or not knowing to be acknowledged. Unitarians often say revelation is not sealed. We've got to pay attention to life as it still unfolds, to new experiences, new understandings and particularly pay attention to the voices of those on the margins. Because queerness can lead us through our love, our desire, our longings to seek liberation for everyone. I have just a few more words from Mihi Kim Court, which seem fitting ones to leave you with. She writes, a queer spirituality challenges the compartments that we, not God, have created. A queer spirituality encourages us towards candidly questioning what stirs our hearts. A queer spirituality urges us not to blindly accept what culture gives us, but to interrogate it thoughtfully, wholeheartedly and prayerfully. A queer spirituality welcomes desire. The butterflies we feel, the restlessness and the longing, they all have so much to tell us about ourselves. Thank you.